Okay, I have a few questions in here, and before I answer these questions, maybe I should just say a few words about the, sut the sutra that I, on the, on, the, on the TV, Amitabha Sutra. Now, in the North American culture, or in Europe, uh, the heaven concept is the most prevalent in many religions. Everybody is talking about going to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Roman Catholic, Christian, whatever religions, uh, they're always talking about going to heaven after death. So the heaven concept is related to the after death concept. Everybody. Um, care about where they're going. But some people, of course, they don't care. Some people said, if I haven't finished my living, I don't have time for, the, for, for dying. <laughs> Why should I consider dying? Dying is so remote from me. Pe most people are like that. Dying is so remote. Uh, I'm, I'm not dying. I'm healthy. Why should I care about dying? But there are people who are, who are, more, who are more far-sighted, seeing into what happened after death. Um, now, whether we should care about after death, uh, what's the emphasis we should, we should place in considering after death? Now, that's another issue. Um, after all, if you think that death is so remote from you, that may not be the case. It does not matter whether you're old or young, death is always between a breath. You know, sometimes youngsters, you see him today, 18, 19, one accident would, would take his life away. So um, death is any time. So since death is any time, uh, people usually have two kinds of worries. One is, where would I go after I died? And another is, uh, when I'm dying, will I be painful? What I would go through? What, what, what kind of experiences I will go through when I'm dying? Many people have worries about dying too. Because um, this kind of worries is because you, in daily life, we, uh, we witness the pain of dying. We imagine the pain of dying. Uh, we worry about the pain of dying. We worry about the suffering of dying because we have seen friends and relatives who, who really suffer. And some people, really, if you're a volunteer to hospital, hospital care, some people are in hospital care for years, for months, breathing the last breath. They couldn't, they couldn't let go of it. And uh, sometimes I, I, I think it's quite valuable experience to, to work in hospital care as a volunteer so you know how people suffer. Um, I have seen people who suffer in, ho um, in hospital care, in the hospital mm -hmm. bed for three years, breathing his last breath. So death is something that people are worrying about. There's no use just worrying about it. Why do you want to find out more information about dying? More, in more information about the experiences of dying? More information about what, do you, what happened to you after death. What can you do about it? About dying? Are you interested in knowing what happened to me when I died? It's too late to learn about it when you're dying. Because you only experience what, you're gonna, what, what will be confronting you. The Amitabha Sutra talks about what should you do before you die and what should you do when you are dying and where will you go after death. 
all these issues are being talked about, uh, are being pondered upon by people who care. And there are many books about dying. The Tibetan Book of the Dead. That's one of the, one of the, most, one of the most famous ones in about dying. Um, for example, it talks about what happened to you, to you when you're dying. People like to talk about a soul. We all talk about common people. It does not matter what religion you, you believe in. They're always talking about a soul. S-O-U-L, soul. And, of course, different religions may use different definitions. In Buddhism, it's not just soul it's talking about. It talks about the consciousness, the alaya consciousness. The soul actually is a conglomeration of not just not just the consciousness, it's about eight consciousnesses, of course. Now, when we are dying, what happened to the soul? If you define that as soul. When you are the verge of dying, or when you are suffering from dying, then your soul is waiting to leave your body. Now, I, I have to be very careful in using that quote unquote soul. Uh, but just for the, for the sake of understanding, I don't want to use a liar consciousness, the eighth consciousness and all that. Just use a common, understandable English term, the soul. What happened to your soul? When you're the witch of dying, when you're dying, what happened to your soul? Because we be, uh, most people believe that everybody has a soul. Your soul, cold and cold soul, leaves the body from six places. That's what we call the understanding of the bado stage of death. Now, if you already have known about those six places, and I don't have to repeat it, anyone who does not know about it, raise your hands so you all know about it. Oh, all right. So those who don't raise your hands, that means you already know. But anyway, since there are some people who don't know, maybe I summarize it. When you are dying, your soul leaves the body through six places. And we all know that when you're dying, you don't have any temperature after a while. After, after a few hours, you don't have any temperature anymore. You don't have a breath. You don't have a temperature. And um, your circulation is not really working. In some part, it may be working. And if your, your whole body would become cold and stiff. And since the whole body is cold, if the soul leaves through, the, through the, the, the bottom of your feet, the sutra says, that's a victim of hell. You go to, to inferno because the, the soul leaves the body from the lowest point, from the soles of your feet. So all your body, it's cold, but then the last warmth, when you feel it, is from the sole of the feet. Then that sentient being is going down to inferno. If the soul lifts through the knee, kneecaps, so all the body is cold, you touch the kneecap areas, there's still a little bit of warmth in it, that means the last warmth leaves through there. It's just like when you have a tube, the place where you feel the warmth is the place where the, the warmth disappeared at the last. So when the, when the heat comes from the kneecaps, that's the animal rams. You reincarnate in animal rams. A chicken, a dog, a dog, a cat, a, you know, I don't know. A lizard, a snake, we don't know. Uh, wh what kind of animals you reincarnate into depends on your own karma. Um, okay, that's in the kneecap. I'm just summarizing it for you because I still have these questions to, to talk about. And it leaps, your soul leaps through the, the stomach. Every, every part of the body is already cold, and you still feel a little warm in your stomach. That's the ghost ram. If every part of the body is cold, and you still have the, the warmth, the, the, the last uh, feeling of warmth is from the chest, that's the human ram. What kind of humans? 
You're born in Africa, in North America, in Canada, in China, we don't know. Depends on your karma and all this relationship that you have built up when you were, when you were alive. And then the soul leaves the body through the eyes, that's the heaven realm, going to heaven. If the soul leaves the body from the tip, top, from the top of the head, that's to the enlightenment realm. And according to the sutras, most people left, the souls of most people left through the soles, the knees, the stomach, the chest. Very few people go to the heaven realm, and extremely few people go to the enlightened realm. Those are the six, six locations, uh, six chakras, if we can call it, that the soul will leave. The soul got to leave through some places, right? Those are the six places. All right, now, I still have a lot more to say about death. But nowadays, you can always read from the Google, from, from internet. Try to research in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and about dying, about experiences of dying, about books, about near-death experiences. And all that would tell you some information. Life is not just this one life. It's a continuation from the previous. And if you're not enlightened yet, going into reincarnation, a continuation into the future reincarnation. You taught us to walk slowly. Is walking fast still okay? Why not? Fast and slow, it does not matter. In the, um, in the Zen meditation of China, they really run, not just walk fast. 30 miles an hour. And if you don't run fast, they plank you. Fast. Because some people, some meditators believe that if you really walk fast, your, your attention is in the walking. Because you can't bump into others. You really have to, you, ha you, you have the tension of avoiding others. In other words, you gear your attention to the, to, to the running. I have never seen someone who, who, who achieved a, a 100 meter race come out with the winner who didn't pay attention to his running. His all tension and, and his, all his energy is, con is, is, is converged into the whole running process. He really concentrate. I wouldn't see anybody who just desultorily think about running a hundred rays and he win the race, no. So running fast has its benefits in attention. And if you walk slowly, you tend to, you tend to be sluggish and you can be sleeping too when you're walking. So some uh, um, Asian meditators, if they come from, for example, from Malaysia, Singapore, they are so much used to the uh, Theravada school, they walk really, really slowly. And they always think that walking slowly is the best because my country, the meditators in my country are doing that. They didn't realize that in China, in some meditation hall, they run. They run and, and you can even hear the sound of their sleep floating in the air and, and you know, all kinds of sound. And uh, that's what it is. Okay, next. How can one become a monk here in Vancouver? I think it's more important, why do you want to become a monk? It's not just location. So if, 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 if I say, being a monk just in Vancouver, but how about a monk in Houston, going to Houston? So I'm a monk in Vancouver and I always stay in Vancouver because Vancouver has nice weather. Vancouver has refreshed air. We have democracy in here, everybody is free. And uh, I don't like to go to another country to become a monk. So you're selective in which location. Well, consider the objective of being a monk. Why do you want to become a monk? Not just the location. I want to choose a place where I eat the best, lift the best, breathe the fresh air, the best air. Then that's a good place for me to be a monk. Is that the objective of being a monk? In some really theory of other really practicing uh, very um, uh, good monk, I mean monk who, who really work hard, they went to the forest and they practiced under Ajahn for 20 years, meditating in the forest. Mosquitoes around, they have a, everybody's given a mosquito net and you go out and you meditate. 
you're living in a mosquito net. And what they eat is not something like this. You've been spoiled compared to what they've got. A dessert after meal? Forget it. <laughs> you probably would chop just one piece of, 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 of bamboo or sugar cane and hand it to you. Here's your dessert. Nothing like a cake. What, do you want a chocolate cake or a red beans cake? No. You got mosquitoes, you got snakes. You know, under different situations, they, they, your, your intention of enlightenment is not being influenced by the conditions surrounding you. You can overcome them. You're talking about here in Vancouver, you become a monk. Well, well don't let me stifle your, 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 your conscientiousness in becoming a monk. Why do you want to become a monk? What is your objective in becoming a monk? Uh, that's more important. And then, we take, and then after you have, you have identified the right motive, then we say, well, should I become a monk? That's important. When you're talking about Vancouver, you're talking about which teacher I should get ordained under. If you ordain under a teacher that's not appropriate for you, you could be wasting your time. So you really have to choose the kind of teaching, the practice in that temple. Location is not the right is the, the main issue. Only in real estate it is. Location, location, location. But not in becoming a monk. Next question. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Does this mean that no good deed goes un unpunished? You mean good deed would good deeds will be punished? No, I don't think so. Good deeds will need the good results. Who would punish good deeds? Yeah, cruel kings may, may punish good deeds. But say if you have done something really right, you are a saint in a, in a, in a country where there's, a, a, where there's tyranny. The king said, you're a, you're a sage and uh, you're even more famous than me. I want to execute you. So you're a sage, you're a saint, that means you are carrying out good deeds, but I being a tyrant, I want to execute you. Why would, would this punishment be landing on that sage? It's not because of what he has done, the good deeds. It's probably because of in previous life, that sage, that saint, could have done something wrong to the king. Now the king is seeking a revenge, not because of his good deeds. Good cause would only lead to good effect. Good cause would not lead to bad effects. Only bad effects will, uh, only bad cause would, would lead to bad effects. They won't mix. But they won't mix. How does this compare with the law of cause and effect? How can a good thought lead to a good outcome? Well, If I use the example of an apple tree, I have chosen my, my seed, and that seed for that apple is from a healthy tree, and after I planted it, the shooting will come out, and then I slowly nurtured it, I gave it to all the attention, for the, for the, I have to put in my labor into it, and I really care for it. I watch its growth every day, and I want to make sure that it has the proper sunshine. I want to make sure that it has the proper watering. I want to make sure that even the air is good around it. I'm, I'm contributing a, a lot of good causes to make sure that that tree survive. That tree will grow into a good apple tree. And all of a sudden, I find some uh, insects surrounding it. That may affect the tree. Then I'm searching for advice. I'm trying to remove the insects from it. I'm doing everything, all the good deeds, to make sure that that tree survive and that tree grow healthy. If I've done all the preparation, that tree will not die. Even that tree is ready to die, I choose another location for it. I try every way to put all the good causes together to make sure that that tree would survive and I get apples from it. How can it go bad? unless there's some mistakes in, your, in, in, in the process of building good causes. So how can a good thought lead to a good outcome? Because you have made all the preparation. You have contributed all the factors to it that make it come true. It depends on you. Not depends on the tree. Depends on you how you do it. 
Next question. A big thank you to Venerable Hong Chi for another wonderful talk with inspiring examples while I struggle with developing patients all the time. This will help me tremendously. So I answer all the questions, and there's the questions that Reverend Hong will answer because he's talking about patients. Yeah, I have a question here. Um, so this is uh, related to the talk that I just gave. The question is, what is the difference between the patient in a few words about that question, just a few words. Patience, forgiveness, and endurance, they are related. Um, how do you practice? How do you practice be, being patient? How do you practice endur endurance? And how do you practice all these uh, virtues? In meditation, every meditation sitting is a practice to us higher endurance, higher patience, and higher forgiveness. Why? When we're meditating, what do we do? Let go, right? Letting go. So all these things that come through my senses, I won't let it stay in my mind to disturb me, and I won't seek for revenge for what has disturbed me. I just let go of it. It's just like in the morning when your wife is nagging you when you when when your when your when your girlfriend said I want to I want to divorce you know all kinds of um, maybe disrespectful languages and things like that you learn to let go you won't you won't that uh, you won't let that affect your whole day's work you won't let that affect your whole day's um, feelings so meditation is actually pre training you to let go uh, when you let go, that means you have more patience. When the, when the black crow is disturbing you, you have the patience of letting it go. When the car is honking and disturbing meditation, you have to let it go. When you think about yesterday's enemies, yesterday's unpleasing events, you let it go. When you worry about the future, you let it go. All these things you let go. So actually, you don't know the wonder of meditation. Now you know. Every sitting, it's an enhancement to your experiences in life in training yourself how to let go, 
how to render generosity, how to build up your endurance, how to give forgiveness, how to be kind, how to build up your wisdom. So don't underestimate every session of meditation, be it at home or in the temple. If you really put your time in training yourself with meditation, wonders will come. It's just like when you, when you watch a television, when you, some, when you watch some people are really awesome and amazing. How can they flip like that? How can the hip hop dancers be doing something like that? Nobody would, can do something like that. Why? Because they practice and practice and practice until they sharpen their skill. But what's the objective of practicing that? Practicing that? They want fame. They want to say, oh, you're great. I mean, you can hip hop like that, or you can rap like that, you can dance like that, you can somersault, you can, you can do all kinds of amazing feats that nobody can do. It's an enhancement of self. But the meditation is a giving of self, letting go of self. In the process of doing that, you sharpen your skill, your skill of obtaining wisdom, your skill of going to enlightenment. But how many people would, sit, would put the same kind of practice in terms of time and efforts to meditation? They want to put all that in hip-hop, singing. They want to win. They want to praise. The Olympic trainer, if an, if an Olympic person, athlete, spend the same time meditation as they put in their, their games, in the practice, they may be a Buddha in no time. But the game would give them an enhancement of self. They have been habitually doing that to enhancement, enhance the self. But mind you, if those Olympic trainers or uh, 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 athletes, if they all of a sudden turn their attention to enlightenment, they are highly successful people they will be more successful than the average people, average person. Think about that. 